guys, this is Dr. Ali, uh, one of the MSK radiologists at Temple, who's uh, coming in to talk to us about a couple topics. First topic being the uh, radio radiologic assessment of the spine, uh, and the second topic is imaging of repetitive strain injuries. Uh, we appreciate his time, so thanks for coming to uh, lecture us. Thank you. Um, so basically, each lecture is going to be about 45 minutes each. Um, it's going to be more useful to you guys if you ask questions along the way rather than me just uh, giving a didactic lecture. I think you get a lot more out of it. Do, do you do any radiology rotations? I, I know that the residents come sometimes to Temple to do a month of uh, MSK radiology, but it's kind of hit or miss. We see the residents sometimes, but do you have like a dedicated block in radiology? Okay, do you get a lot of experience looking at films? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So just ask questions along the way, all right? I have nothing to disclose. Okay, so what we'll talk about is the anatomy, um, mainly focus on degenerative changes in the spine, talk a little bit about instability and uh, trauma imaging. Arthritis and tumors are more or less left out of this lecture because it's really not that important, and some of the emergencies that we may see um, on spine imaging. So the standard films that we normally do for the cervical spine are an AP, a lateral view, a swimmer's view to look at the C7, T1 articulation, and then the oblique films to evaluate the foramina and the facets. The open mouth view and the Fuchs view, um, have you guys heard that term, Fuchs? The Fuchs view is done to look at the dance. Most times not very useful. All right, so on the AP film, what do you see? So this is AP, not it's a lateral. Um, I wish I had a better point here. But the most important things that you can look for, for on the AP film is the uncovertebral joints or the joints of Lushka. You see that here? These are the joints of Lushka right here. That's, of course, the disc. These are the spinous processes. And then on the lateral film, the first thing that we always comment on is how many of the cervical vertebrae you can see. So this is C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, a good C-spine lateral should include T1, but if not, this, this room is becomes useful. So that's, that's the arch of C1. Um, this kind of rounded structure, do you see that? Does anyone know what this is? That's known as the ring of Harris, okay? Uh, that, that circular area is important when you're looking at trauma patients for fractures of C2. Because what will happen is you lose that ring, you get an interruption of that ring. And then we trace the anterior spinal line, we look at the posterior spinal line, we look at the spinal laminar line, okay, which is this one here in the back. And then people talk about the posterior pedicular line, which is the posterior aspect of the pedicles, but it's really difficult to do unless you have a perfectly straight lateral film. And then the posterior spine. But when you're talking about stability or instability and trauma, look at the anterior spinal line. And the most important one is the posterior spinal line. This is the one that we spend most of the time looking at. Then on the lateral film, you should be looking at the dense and pre-dental space. That space between the anterior arch of C1 and the anterior margin of C2, right here. Normally, it's about 3 millimeters or less in an adult patient. In a kid, it should be about 5 millimeters or less. So this is the swimmer's view. It's not really projecting that well. Um, so the swimmer's view is done exactly like you're swimming. So one arm is up, one arm is pushed down, and you're actually rotating your shoulders. And the goal is to try and get the humeral heads away from C7, T1. So that's one arm that's up. This is the spine coming down, and you can, you can appreciate the cervical thoracic junction here. Do you see that? A lot of times, pathology is quite frequently missed when you don't do a good uh, swimmer's film. The oblique views. So if you look at this film, and you look at this film, which foramina are we looking at here? Take a guess. So this is labeled left, right? <laughs> That's like, no, but it's wrong. The this is the left side of the patient. And if you do the film AP, so you're like this. You do the film AP and you rotate up like that. It's actually the right cervical parameter you're looking at. So it's, it's the converse of what happens in the lumbosacral spine. So it's important to know that. When you're looking at the left obliques done in the AP projection, it's the right neural parameter you're looking at. Um, conversely, over here, it's the left side you're looking at. So if you look on this particular um, image, you can see the nice foramen, nice foramen. What's happening here? You see something sticking out into the foramen? So that's bony hypertrophy or osteoarthritis at the uncovertebral joints or the joints of Lushka that's sticking out into the foramen. 
that's what's going to cause impingement to the exiting nerve roots. Do, do you appreciate that? So it's AP, and it's the opposite of what you're seeing on the film, the labeling of the film. If the film is done PA, it's the reverse. But we never really do the film's PA, OK? So look, look for the marker, and it's usually the opposite side. Generally, yes. Gen I, I shouldn't say always, but generally. Okay, because the films are done AP, and the patients, they always put the mark on the side that's closest to the film. Right, so the left is going to be closer to the film, but it's actually the right foramen you're looking at. Open mouth view. So that's the dense. That's the lateral masses of uh, C1. So look at the margins here, look at the margins here, make sure they're well aligned. But this space can be affected by rotations. So if the person is turning his head, you may see some asymmetry between here and here, and here and here. But this margin of C1 should always be sitting on the margin of C2. If you fracture the arch of C1, what will happen is because the transverse ligament is ruptured, this will move laterally. Okay? So you get widening of the arch of C1 on the, AP, on, on the open mouth. The Fuchs view is, in my opinion, not really useful. You can sort of vaguely see the bends here. Do you see that here? And, and, and what it's done is a lot of times when you do the open mouth view, you open your mouth and you shoot the beam through the mouth. And you're trying to get dense, but what happens? The basic skull, this, right, kind of gets in the way of the dance. And the way of getting around that is by doing the Fuchs view. The patient hyperextends his neck, and you shoot the beam up. And the goal is to try and get that dance inside of the foramen magnum. So you see it, you see the dance, but you don't have really good detail. You've got to have a really big fracture for you to see it on the Fuchs view. All right, cervical ribs. <clears throat> Do you guys see cervical ribs a lot? Do you call it a lot? So it's actually quite common. Um, so normally, uh, most people have 12 ribs, right? And they're all linked up to your thoracic vertebrae. But in about 0.5% of the patient population, you, you can have a cervical rib, which is a rib arising from C7, typically. You can go all the way up to C4, but most commonly, it's at C7. It's most commonly unilateral, but it can be bilateral. Well, it actually says here, more commonly bilateral, but it's more commonly that you have a big one on one side and a tiny one on the other side, OK? And it's not to be confused with a hyperplastic transverse process of C7, it's not, which is known as fourth cervical rib or apophysomegaly. So this, this is a kind of classic cervical rib. That's, that's your first rib on the left side. Do you appreciate that? And the first rib on the right side here. And then you have this little extra rib that's coming from C7. Now, how do you know that this is coming from C7 and this is not the first rib? Um, the, the left-sided first rib from T1, it's absent. Does anyone know? So typically, when you look at the T-spine, the transverse processes point upwards, okay, like that. So if you have a rib that's articulating with that, it's going to be a thoracic rib. If you see the transverse point, the process pointing sideways or pointing downwards, it's a cervical rib. What's the importance of cervical ribs? It, it can cause thoracic outlet syndrome, okay? And the size of the rib does not correlate with the symptoms. You can have a really big rib and no symptoms. You can have a tiny rib and symptoms. So it's important to look for cervical ribs. Any questions so far on C-spine? Going to get into much more interesting pathology soon. Lumbosacral spine, AP, lateral, so kind of standard AP, lateral. This is the coned L5-S1 view. Now we look at L5-S1 on the lateral film. And then on the AP film, you can do a Ferguson view, which is an angled beam. So what you do is, if you go back here, if you look at the slope of L5-S1, it kind of slopes downwards like this. So when you do the AP film, you don't really see it very well in profile. So the Ferguson view now is designed to angle up so you can see straight into L5-S1. So you angle the beam upwards and you get a better profiling of L5-S1. You appreciate that? So that's L5-S1. So when you're not seeing it good in a standard AP film, ask for a Ferguson view. Oblique films now, this is the actual opposite of the, the cervical spine. So which side are we looking at and what are we looking at? If the right side is down, okay, let's use the side of the marker. If the left side is down, okay, you're actually looking at the left facet and the left pars interarticularis. So just remember it's the opposite of what you're looking at in the cervical spine. So has anyone talked to you guys about the Scotty dog? Right. So that's the scotty dog that you're seeing here, right? That's the eye, that's the ear, that's the neck, that's the nose, that's the front legs, the body. And the next 
image, if you look at it, that's the Scotty dog. Um, so the pedicle is the eye. The ear is the superior pickle of the set. The nose is a transverse process. This is the, the neck, right, the, or the collar of the Scotty dog. That's where the pars antarctic and ours is. Leg, front leg is the inferior articula of the set. And then the body is the lamina. Then if you look over here now, it's the opposite side. So the tail, this is the tail, is going to be the superior articula of the set on the opposite side. So for example, if you have the right side down, down this is the right pars, right superior articula of the set, and this is going to be the left side. You appreciate that? Most of the pathology of these things over here, right in the neck of the Scotty dog. What, what typically happens in the neck of the Scotty dog? Pars defects, that's correct. T-spine, AP film, lateral film. The lateral film is done with the patient breathing. Ideally, you want to have the patient breathing just a little bit because you want to blur out the ribs and see the, uh, see the thoracic vertebrae better. Problem again is you don't see the upper T-spine. You may need to do a swimmer's view as well. So standard views we do is AP, lateral, and a swimmer's view for the thoracic spine. All right, transitional anatomy. And this becomes really, really important when you're talking about patients going for surgery. Some patients can have four lumbar vertebrae, some can have six, some can have something that looks somewhat in between. And the last thing you want is the surgeon to go in and remove a disc that's at the wrong level. Okay? So what you can get is lumbarization of S5. And typically, what will happen is because the S1 is normally kind of like a wedge shaped appearance, if S1 is lumbarized, it looks more like a wedge. Or if L5 is sacralized, it looks more like a square. So if you look at this, right, this is, <clears throat> this is L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Some people label that transitional vertebrae as a, a lumbosacral transitional vertebrae. But I think it's better to say either L5 is lumbar, um, sacralized or there are six lumbar type vertebral bodies. And the best, what's the best way of counting the number of lumbar vertebrae? Take a guess. Count the ribs. Count the ribs. Look at the chest x-ray. If you have a chest x-ray in the past, count the number of ribs. So sometimes the patient may have just four lumbar vertebrae or may have six lumbar vertebrae. And transitional anatomy becomes important in Bertolotti syndrome. Have any of you guys heard about that? So in Bertolotti syndrome, you get a hyperplastic transverse process of typically L5. Um, it's very large spatular enlargement of L5, and um, if you look at this, this is an example of Bertolotti syndrome. This is L5. You can see the mark enlargement. Do you see that here of the transverse process? And it's forming an articulation with the sacrum and the ilium. And at that articulation, you can get sclerosis. You can get, if you do MRs on these patients, you can get a lot of edema around the areas, and they can be quite symptomatic. The other thing is that in Bertolotti syndrome, not only is the pain arising from here, but the level above tends to fail, okay? So you tend to get discal disease or degenerative disc disease in the level above the transitional lumbosacral junction. So when you have the spatula enlargement here, don't just focus on that because the disc above may be failing as well. All right, so degenerative disc disease now. We'll talk about degenerative disc disease. We'll talk about degenerative changes. We'll talk about dish ankylosing spondylitis. And they can all look fairly similar. So what my goal is to try and show you some features that helps to distinguish between, um, sorry. Yes. My apologies. Right, okay, so in degenerative disc disease now, or degenerative changes, see, you look at the C2, C3, C4. Do you see these little things coming from the end plates right here? Those are osteophytes, correct? Right, the end plates. Uh, this space is, just looks a little bit narrow compared to this. So ideally, as you're moving from the upper cervical spine downwards, your disc height should be getting just a little bit bigger. So that's, that's just reactive osteophytes at the end plates of your uh, vertebral bodies. As you get older, you start forming bone just by normal stresses at the edges of your end plates. But in degenerative disc disease, and I'll show you a much better example um, later on. So in this patient, this facet joint osteoarthritis on the AP film, do you appreciate that? Kind of bulky osteophytes, kind of sclerosis here in the facet joints. So these are the vertebral bodies, these are the facet joints. It's like just a little bit of the thesis of L4 and L5. On flexion extension views, we talk about instability in a second. It's a little bit increased in flexion and going back just a little bit better in the extension film. We'll talk a little bit more about instability. 
And then the oblique thumbs. The oblique thumbs, like I showed you, if you're looking at the left, you're looking at the left facets. And this film kind of nicely demonstrates a normal looking facet here. Do you see the nice space here? But as you get down to four, five, and five, one, there's a lot of bulky osteophytes around the facet joint. And you can see the space is narrow relative to these. That's facet joint osteoarthritis. So the goal of looking at the oblique thumbs it, in, in the cervical spine is to look at the foramina, in the lumbar spine is to look at the facet joints, okay? So in, in plain old um, degeneration, as you get older and you form osteophytes at the edges of the bone, you'll find little spurs forming at the end plate. But what happens in degenerative disc disease is you form traction spurs. Have you guys heard about that? So the disc now, when, when you have, this is a normal disc here. This disc height looks smaller compared to that. Do you appreciate that? So the, the annulus fibrosis of that disc attaches just away from the end plate. It doesn't attach right to the end plate. So it attaches down here. So when the disc starts to fail and it starts to prolapse backwards, it pulls on that attachment and it forms new bone at that attachment. So what you'll find is you get these spurs forming or these claws forming away from the end plate. See the distance between the end plate and this spur? That spur never really goes toward, uh, beyond the end plate. So when you see a gap between the end plate and the spur forming here, it usually means degenerative disc disease. The disc itself is failing, not just forming osteophytes at the end plates from old age. So that's traction spurs as compared to just your, your standard osteophytes at the margins of, of the pubic bodies, and it indicates degenerative disc disease. So always look at that osteophyte, look at the bone forming, and see if there's a gap between that and the end plate. If there is a gap, that's a traction spur, and it means the disc is failing. It's degenerative disc disease. This is another example of a big traction claw, or traction osteophyte down here. See the end plate? This is a degenerative disc on the MR image. Spaces that are subchondral sclerosis, and you see the, the, the osteophyte or the bone forming far away from the end plate. You appreciate that? So that's a traction spur. And that can look pretty similar if you have a lot of them to diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis or DISH. I'm sure you guys see DISH all the time, right? DISH is bone forming, as the name implies, it's diffuse, it's idiopathic, and it's uh, hyperostosis, a lot of bone is forming. Typically affects middle-aged males, and for you to make the diagnosis, you have these bulky osteophytes forming down the anterior spine. Um, classically, it's taught that it must involve four contiguous levels for you to call it dish. That may cause compression of the esophagus, bronchus, or IVC, and these patients with dish are also prone to developing heterotopic ossifications. That's important to know. So if you've got a patient that's, who has a spine that's full of dish osteophytes and he's going to get his hip replaced, chances that he will form heterotopic ossification is much greater than the average person, okay? So dish formers are heterotopic bone formers as well. So this is an example of Forestier syndrome, or this is a barium swallow. These are the bulky osteophytes of dish, and I'll show you a much better example. It's causing compression onto the esophagus. So those osteophytes, or those dishophytes as we call them, can compress the esophagus, and patients can present a lot of dysphagia and discomfort. So this is DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Now, I mentioned to you guys before that the traction spur is away from the end plate, right, in degenerative disc disease. In DISH, the bone that forms runs from the mid-body to the mid-body to the mid-body to the mid-body. Mid you appreciate that? It's much more bulky. It starts about the mid-body, and it usually goes across the disc to the other side. So that looks different from a traction spur in degenerative disc disease. So you have bone at the end plate, that's just osteophytes from old age. You have a traction spur away from the end plate, that's degenerative disc disease. And then you have dish or dishophytes where it runs from the mid-body, it's very bulky to the mid-body, to the mid-body, to the mid-body, and it has to involve, theoretically, four contiguous levels. So another example. And again, another example of dish compared to traction spur. Traction spur away from the end plate, doesn't cross the disc. Dish starts at the mid-body, crosses the disc, and goes to the next body. Okay? And it's usually a lot more bulky. It's not usually small like this. And then an example now of degenerative change, osteophytes forming the end plate, dish Big bulky osteophytes in the cervical spine crossing the disc start from mid-body to mid-body 
And then this is ankylosing spondylitis, which I didn't really talk much about it before. It looks exactly the opposite. So you get this thin syndesmophytes coming down the anterior body, and then the bodies of the retrieval bodies are square. Okay? So you lose that normal con concavity you have normally anteriorly here in the C-spine. In ankh-spawn, the retrieval bodies become square, and the osteophytes very thin, very, very thin, coming all the way down, not bulky like this. Because I've seen several times patients, people confuse dish with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. All right, any questions on that, on plantums, subtraction spurs, degenerative change, uh, and dish? Okay, so moving on to degenerative disc disease now. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the nomenclature, talking about um, how you describe the discs and, and its relevance. So the terms typically that we use when we're talking about a disc is a disc bulge, herniation, protrusion, or extrusion. And the easiest thing to remember is a bulge involves more than 180 degrees of the disc. A herniation is less than 180 degrees. And a herniation could be either a protrusion or an extrusion. So herniation can be divided into protrusion or extrusion, and bulge is separate from herniation. Bulge is more than 180 degrees. Herniation is less than 180 degrees. So the difference between an extrusion and a protrusion is the shape of the neck. And I'll, I'll show you an example. It's probably better if you, show, if you look at images rather than reading what I have on the, on, on the screen. Um, an annular rupture now is a tear of the annulus fibrosus. It typically occurs in the posterior lateral part of the disc because that's the weakest portion of the disc. And it's either contained or uncontained. Contained is if there's some residual fibers of the disc remaining behind, and uncontained is if the nucleus pulposus is coming through. So what, what do I mean? This is a normal disc. That's a schematic. That's the body. That's the body. That's the disc. And then the disc starts to bulge. If you look at it from the top or on the axial plane, it's usually a circumference, the entire circumference of the disc, but anything more than 180 degrees of the disc is referred to as bulging. If it's less than 180 degrees, it's a herniation. And the herniation can be either a protrusion or an extrusion. And the protrusion, the base of that extruded material, or the base of that herniated material is broader than the tip, whereas the reverse happens in extrusion. Extrusion is like you're squeezing toothpaste out of a out of um, a, a, a tube. So what happens is that the base is going to be smaller than the dome. So bulge, 180 degrees or more. Herniation, less than 180. Herniations can be either protrusions or extrusions. That's an annular rupture. That's a nucleus pulposus fibers getting through the annulus tear here. That's an example of what it looks like in T2-weighted images. See the bright cleft here? You guys see that? On the T2-weighted images, that's an annular tear. And I had mentioned now that the, the, the herniations can be, um, are usually less than 180 degrees. And just to make things even more confusing, they can be focal or broad-based. But they're still less than 180 degrees. Okay? So you can get a focal herniation or a broad-based herniation. So that's a, th this is an example. Which one is this? Is this protrusion or, or extrusion? This is protrusion. And this is extrusion, OK? So that neck is smaller than the dome. And it's important to know that, because when you're reading reports and people talking about protrusions, extrusions, they're actually different things. Disc protrusions, kind of disc herniations, could be central. It could be paracentral or paramedian. It could be foraminal. And these are ones that are frequently missed by radiologists or uh, non-MSK radiologists or non-neuroradiologists, the lateral disc extrusions because they're extra foraminal and you don't really pay much attention to this area. And the exiting nerve root can come out like that and be impinged by that extra foraminal disc extrusion or herniation. And then the disc material now, so when the annulus tears, it can migrate outwards. If it migrates outwards and contain, you get disappearance. But if it breaks off, you get a sequestration. This is the one that's really a lot of medical legal implications because this disc extrusion or disc herniation when the fragment breaks off, can migrate quite a significant distance away from the disc, okay? And if you don't mention it, and you don't mention it on MR, and you don't see it on MR, the surgeon goes in, doesn't find the migrated disc material, and you get failed back surgery. So look for, look for sequestration. Look for that sequestered fragment that breaks off from the disc. If it doesn't break off from the disc, it's not a sequestered fragment. 
So an example of a protrusion, the base is broader than the dome. The base is broader than the dome. This is foraminal extrusion, I'm sorry, protrusion. And then this is disc extrusion with some migration inferiorly. But if you look at the migration, it's still communicating with the disc, so it's not a sequestration. And in the rupture, we spoke about that, we spoke about that. And this is a migrated disc, and this is the sequestered disc, basically the same thing. So there's an example here. This is this material, and this is a big fragment. Actually, you couldn't, you couldn't really make a communication between the fragment and the native disc. So that's disc sequestration. Any questions so far on the terminology? So just remember, more, more than one bulge, less than 180 degrees, it's a herniation. Modic changes in the spine. Type 1, type 2, type 3. And type 1 is an edema pattern, type 2 is a fatty pattern, and type 3 is fibrosis. So if you remember, T1s are going to be bright. T2s are generally, we always do T2s with fat suppression. So whenever you see fluid, it's going to be bright on a dark background. We never do T2s without fat suppression. So it, the edema pattern is like this. This is a disc that's failing. If you look at the end plates, right, this is a disc that's failing. These are T1 weighted images here. These are T2 with fat suppression over here. So this dark area now becomes bright on the T2s. That's the edema. And this area that's dark on the T1 remains dark on the T2s. So that's fibrosis. So this is modic type 1 change, and this is modic type 3 change coexisting together. There's another patient with modic type 2 changes now, where it looks more like fat. And the way to really pick it up is if you look at the subcutaneous fat here, fat is going to be bright. So if it looks bright on the T1, it's fat. And then we do T2s with fat suppression. So if it's, going to, if it's containing fat, it's going to get dark, right, because you're suppressing out the signal from fat. So in order of severity, or um, modic type 1 is a edema pattern, modic type 2 is a fatty pattern, modic type 3 is a fibrosis pattern, okay? And oftentimes they coexist. And it indicates, so it sort of, in, not directly, but sort of indicates the severity of disease. All right, spondylolysis now, pars defects. Classically at L5, can occur anywhere in the spine, but classically at L5. What's the best film to look for a pars defect? It's actually lateral film. The most sensitive film is lateral film. The most specific film is an oblique film. So if you look here, body, and this is the pars interarticularis. Do you see that lucent line here? That's the pars defect. It's got a little bit of listhesis of L4 and L5. Let's assume this is L4. What does that mean? Usually if there's listhesis, it means it's usually a bilateral pars defect, okay? So this is a pars defect. Um, it's kind of really difficult to see, but down here, okay? And then on the bleak films, right, the neck of the Scotty dog, do you appreciate it here? That lucent line in the neck, do you guys appreciate that? Here. So that's bilateral pars defects. And no one really knows what causes pars defects. They may be a hereditary uh, factor, maybe due to repetitive microstresses. Which patient population has a high incidence of pars defects? What's that? Uh, actually, Eskimos. Eskimos have a very... No, I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. They have a very high incidence of, of pars defects. All right, okay. Yes. All right, so talking about spondylolisthesis now, when the body slips on the necks, if it's less than 25% of the body, it's grade 1. If it's 25 to 50%, it's grade 2. If it's 50 to 75 percent, it's grade three spondylolisthesis, and grade four it's when it's more than 75 percent. Have you guys heard about a grade five? So, what what's the other term for grade five spondylolisthesis? Spondyloptosis, right? So, in spondyloptosis, which is grade five, the body comes off S1 and lies anterior to it, and it's really uncommon but it's not as uncommon as you think it is. And we'll get to this in a second. There's one particular condition that predisposes patients to getting a grade five spondylolisthesis, and that's a dysplastic spondylolisthesis. But typically, the reason why you get spondylolisthesis is either facet joint degenerative changes, which is most common at L4-5, or PARS defects, bilateral PARS defects, and those are most common at L5, right? L5-S1. 
So when you see L4 slipping on L5, it's usually for set disease in an older person. If you see L5 slipping on LS1, it's usually a parse defect. Okay. And this is an example of someone, a sagittal um, CT scan, a reconstructed CT scan. If you look at the disc, at the body here, L4 is slipping on L5, but the, disc, the, the facet joint is severely degenerative. It's kind of classic appearance. And dysplastic spondylolisthesis. Have you guys heard that terminology before, of dysplastic spondylolisthesis? So it's a lot more common than people think. And you, know, you, you typically see L5 slipping on S1. You think, well, it's going to have a porous defect. But in dysplastic spondylolisthesis, there is no parse defect. And what you ha happen to have is a very dysplastic facet joint. It's very horizontal. It's kind of curved. So they, they tend to slip quite significantly. And if you look at the next image, this is an example of a dysplastic spondylolisthesis. So if you look at the orientation of the facet joint here, do you see how horizontal it looks? Instead of having a nice slope upwards like that, it's horizontally oriented and it's kind of curved. And they slip quite significantly. And if you look at the body of S1, which is this segment here, it also tends to be sort of convex in configuration. So this is an under-recognized but fairly common cause of spondylolisthesis at L5-S1. And this is the one that typically, typically gives you pretty significant um, slippage. So dysplastic spondylolisthesis. When you see that, look at the facet joints see whether they're horizontally oriented, see if they're abnormal in configuration, and look at the shape of, the, of S1, whether it's convex or not. All right, any questions on listhesis and spondylolysis? How yes? How often do you see uh, with the, the dysplastic spondylolysis, how often do you see uh, a different uh, interior movement? Like, how often do you see it? Quite often. I don't have a specific number, very often. Enough to like, pre-screen? Pre-screen people um, in terms of uh, by imaging? Yeah. No, no. I can check on the exact percentage, but I would say the answer to that is no. When you were discussing the set joint characters and orthogonally, you're saying they're more sagittally oriented joints, or they're actually like... Well, normally the facet joints are like this, right? If you look at it laterally. The inferior articular facet and the superior articular facet comes like this. It's more like this. So it's more like the joint is in the axial plane. That's correct. Instead of being an oblique vertical, it goes more horizontal. And they tend to slip off. Okay. Also, patients who have more like sagittally oriented lower facet joints, they get more spinal diseases too, right? They're not they're not axially oriented, but they but the facets can kind of range coronal. That's correct, in that orientation too. Yes. Yes. Um and the other thing about dysplastic spondylolisthesis compared to a pars defect is that when you slip, normally when you slip in a pars defect, you actually widen the canal a little bit. In dysplastic spondylolisthesis, you get quite significant canal stenosis as well. It can be quite significant. So anterior cervical diffusions, um, we see that a lot, and I'm sure you guys see this a lot. So it's done to, for degenerative disc disease, and it's done for multi-level disease. Um, this is kind of classic appearance. That's this, intra-op image, and this is an anterior cervical fusion of power procedure. They, they suck anteriorly, suck out the discs. We put the spacer in between, and then put the plate over here. What's the major problem with these anterior cervical disc fusions? Does anyone know? Apart from loosening of the hardware, infection, bleeding, the usual standard stuff. They tend to have level above disease. Have you heard about that? So they fail fairly often. So what happens is that when you fuse this segment here, you put a lot of abnormal stresses on the disc above and the facets above. So you tend to get degenerative disc disease in the level above the fusion, the facet joint disease in the, in the level above the fusion. Um, this is an example, this projecting really badly. I actually read this case last night. It was a trauma patient, so not related to the spine. So this person had a spinal fusion back in 2007. Do you see the lumbar sp the spinal fusion here? Any kind of spinal fusion does this, by the way. It doesn't have to be the anterior cervical fusion. So you have spinal fusion. Here and this is the nice disc, right? Look what happened uh, eight years later, it's completely failed. Significant progression of disease in the level just above the spinal fusion, level above disease. Okay, how do you avoid that? How can you prevent or decrease the incidence of level above disease? Take a guess. Say I have a degenerative C5 6 disc. What was that? Don't get a fusion. Don't get a fusion. Well, that's true. What else can you do? Yeah. 
So people do cervical um, disc replacements, okay? And this is only indicated for a single level disease or at the most two level disease. And by so going in there and sucking out the disc and putting in a cervical disc replacement, you don't actually fuse the spine, so you don't create an immobile segment here. And you don't put stresses in the disc above to preserve the mobility of the spine. It's not that commonly performed, but it's getting more, um, more popular. Um, again, the, the limitation of this, it can only be done for like a single level of disease or the most two levels. So you can't go in and suck out three different discs and put in three di different disc replacements. It's not going to work. Instability. And this is something that you guys talk about all the time, right? Instability of the spine, cervical spine, lumbar spine. But we always talk about the longitudinal instability. Do you know that there is a rotational instability that goes with the spine too? Anyone? No? Okay. So typically when we do flexion extension films, either in the cervical spine or in the lumbar spine, you bend forward and you bend backwards and you have the neutral position. So what you're doing is you're looking for the total movement of the body above in relation to the body below. So for example, this, 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 if you look here, it's not too bad, but then it slips out, right, on the flexion film. Then on the extension film, it goes back. H how do you measure that amount of translation? Does anyone know? So basically what you do is you measure this distance in the neutral. You method, measure the change in the flexion. You also measure the change in the extension. So for example, if this is moving two on flexion, and then it goes back one millimeter in extension. The total translation is actually three millimeters. And instability is defined by movement of more than how many millimeters? Take a guess. You know, <laughs> it, that's variable too. We generally use 2.5 millimeters. The books will tell you three to 3.5. But we generally use 2.5. So I think you're pretty safe in saying three. Anything more than three, total translation. Total translation is longitudinal instability. But what about the rotational instability? A lot of people don't talk about that, and it's important. So if you look at C5 and C6 here, this is the neutral position, it's bending, it's flexing here. Look at that change in the angulation of the disc, right? Measure it from the level that's slipping above to the end, inferior end plate to, of, the, of that. And if that change, as you flex your neck, is increasing by more than 11 degrees, there's rotational instability as well as longitudinal instability. So if you look at this particular guy here, right, he's flexing, but he's not only translating anteriorly, he's kind of bending like that as well. So he's got a rotational instability as well as longitudinal instability. So that angulation, if it changes more than 11 degrees, it's, it's rotational instability. All right, any questions on that? Any questions at all? No? Do you guys want to see fractures? Or just want to stop, take a break, and we do radiology of rep repetitive strain injuries. You don't really see much. So you want to see fractures? All right, we'll just talk of a, a few of them. So the concept of columns has, uh, do you guys know the concept of the different columns in the spine? So there are three columns, right, good. So in unstable fractures is when two to three columns are affected. And the typical unstable fractures in the cervical spine are Hangman's fracture, Jefferson fracture, type two dens, flexion teardrop, a bilateral jump facets or a unilateral jump facet with an associated fracture. Those are the unstable C-spine fractures. So this is your uh, column concept. The anterior half of the body, the anterior longitudinal ligament is the anterior column. The posterior half of the body and the posterior longitudinal ligament is the middle column. And anything behind that is the posterior column. So if two columns are injured, it's an unstable injury. Jefferson fracture. Fracture of the arch of C1, axial loading injury. So you can pick it up on the plane film. And typically what we do is we do the open mouth view. And if you remember the initial part of my lecture, that's the dance, right? You remember I told you, look at the arch of C1, make sure it's well aligned here on the side. See how this is slipping out? And see how that's slipping out here? What you do is you take the distance from this and measure it to the body over here and add it to this side. If the total distance of it slipping out on the right side and the left side measures more than seven millimeters, it implies the transverse ligament is torn and it's an unstable fracture because not all Jefferson fractures are unstable. But when the transverse ligament is torn, it's unstable. So do the open mouth view. This is not so reliable. Look at the margins over here. Take that distance. Take that distance. I don't know. If it's more than seven millimeters, 
transverse ligament is gone, it's busted, it's unstable. When you do a CT scan, um, R to C1 is broken here. It's important to look to see whether the fracture gets into, what's this? The foramen transversarium, that's where the vertebral arteries go through, right? If it does go through there, then you have to do a CT angiogram to make sure the vessels are patent. Hangman's fracture. What's a Hangman fracture? Fracture of the pars or pedicles of C2. Hyperextension injury. Um, in kids, it's, it's less common in kids because the synchondrosis at the base of the dens, they tend to preferentially fracture through that than fracturing the dens itself, but more, much more common in adults. And neurological deficit is not as common as you would think, though, because of the decompression. You get an, like an auto-decompression um, when the bilateral pars and pedicles are fractured. So this is, kind of, this is the typical appearance of a um, hangman fracture. So it's difficult to see, but if you look in the lateral C-spine, the ring of Harris is disrupted is not a good example of it. This is a pe pedicle fracture, and this is a fracture here, and it's going into the foramen transversarium. So he's going to get a CT angiogram. That's a hangman fracture. Bilateral jump facets. We actually had this case about two, three years ago. And lateral film, it's a beautiful example, not for the patient, but a beautiful example of the jump facet, right? So that's C2, C3, C4. You guys appreciate lateral film? So th these, these are the facets. And this facet should be like this. This facet should be sitting on top there. But this facet has not come from behind here. It's come anterior to the facet below it. And it's got this thesis, right? The body has slipped forward. And this sign is a useful sign on CT imaging. It's called the reverse hamburger sign or hamburger sign. So normally, there's two buns for a hamburger. Right? This bun should be down here, and the other bun should be up here. And then in between is the meat. <laughs> but what happens is when you get the jump facet, this facet that should be behind here, the lower part of your hamburger, jumps to lie on top of the, the top bun. So reverse hamburger sign of a jumped facet. And this patient actually had um, jump facet. See how it's jumped from here, from behind here to lie on tier to it, with an associated fracture. It's not that well demonstrated, but there was an associated fracture. Corresponding MR shows the jump here. The disc is now bulging out. The ligaments are all ruptured and it's compressing the cervical cord. Type 2 dense fractures, they're the most common ones. Unfortunately, um, they're the greatest risk for non union. Type 1 is through the dense tip, type 3 is through the base and type 3 is through, through the body as well as the dance. This is the most common and, again, the most prone to non-union. So this is an older guy. He came in, and I don't remember when, a few a couple years ago, fractured through the base of his dance. You can see the significant posterior displacement makes it very unstable. Um, type 2 dance fracture. This is sagittal T2. I'm sorry, sagittal CT image on bone windows and sagittal um, CT image on soft tissue windows. All right, I'll skip that. Extension teardrop. These injuries, you know, you can get an extension teardrop like that, or you can get a flexion teardrop like that. Which one is more significant? Which one has the worst morbidity? Take a guess. Uh, actually, flexion teardrop injuries are, are, are worse. So they tend to predominate in the lower lumbar spine. The extension teardrops are in the upper um, cervical spine, sorry. So what happens is you hyperextend the neck. The anterior longitudinal ligament rips off a piece of bone here. So you get that little teardrop. Do you, you appreciate that piece of fragment here? That is coming from here. And the body is slipped backwards into the spinal canal. It's an extension teardrop injury. Quite unstable, but not as bad as the flexion teardrop injuries. And this is a really interesting case that we saw maybe five, six, seven years ago. Vertical C1, C2 dissociation is really uncommon. And this person had multi, uh, multi trauma, multi organ injuries. And interestingly enough, <laughs> look at the space here, right? The C1, C2 dissociation on the lateral film. Look at the gap here. And this is a corresponding MR. All the ligaments in that region are completely busted. It's got a spinal cord confusion. But what happened here is that not only was it injured before, but the treatment, they put on a traction halo device, and it made it much worse. So, you got to be really careful when you put on a halo device. You can accentuate, this patient died, obviously, right? And um, so it can be accentuated by a traction halo device. All right, I'm going to stop here. This is a chance fracture. This is a seatbelt fracture. It's less common nowadays because you have not just seatbelts alone. You have the arm strap coming over.
sudden deceleration in the motor vehicle accident basically split the body. So if you look at the fracture here, this is at the thoracic, then classically they are the thoracic lung, thoracolumbar junction. Lower T-spine, upper L-spine. You split the body in two and you cleave it into the facet joints. It's called a chance fracture. It's actually relatively stable. All right, that's an hour. Any questions? There's a lot more I have to show, but in the interest of time. Or do you guys just want me to go on the spine? Or you want to see repetitive strain injuries? Or you want to stop? Keep going, yeah. Keep going spine? All right. All right, vertebroplasties. Um, so we inject cement into the bodies, um, typically for osteoporosis or metastatic disease, anything that's causing a lot of pain. And one of the complications of that is that the cement may leak out, right, and you may get refracturing of the body. Leakage of the cement is not necessarily um, going to be symptomatic, but at times it can. Radiation changes, I'll skip that. What's a Romanus lesion? <laughs> a lesion that you see in ankylosing spondylitis. So it's kind of like the shiny corners that we talk about. It's one of the early signs of um, ankylosing spondylitis on MRI imaging. And it can look like fat and it can look like fluid. So if you look at this MR image, do you see like at the corners right here? See the bright signals here? There's a classic end plate entizitis um, that you get an ank spawn. So right at the corners is where you get the inflammation and you get erosions eventually. And that's, that's known as a Romanus lesion. It's, it's typical for ankylosing spondylitis. H-shaped vertebrae and sickle cell disease. See how the end plates are kind of depressed down here? So there's two theories as to why that happens. In sickle cell disease, the end plates are kind of more central. In the middle portion is more central, and the perfusion is going to fall as you move from the periphery to the central portion of the disc. So therefore, they tend to infarct and they tend to collapse. Or the other theory is that because of the marrow hyperplasia that you get in, in, in the sickle cell disease, it causes expansion in the mid portion of the body, and eventually it fails and collapses centrally. So you end up getting these each shape of the people bodies. Goes like that, up like that, up like that, down like that. Right? So the central portion is kind of squished in, classic for sickle cell disease. And sacral insufficiency fractures, I wouldn't talk too much about that. This is an important point. Um, in approximately 1% of uh, patients with hip arthroplasties, they develop sacral insufficiency fractures afterwards. Why is that so? Why would you develop a sacral insufficiency fracture after hip arthroplasty? So if you think about it, this older patient has got a severely osteoarthritic hip, not walking around, so what happens to your bone? It becomes osteoporotic, right, from disuse. So you now, now you replace the person's hips, he suddenly starts to mobilize, and he mobilizes on a very osteoporotic bone, and they tend to fracture. So it's not an uncommon complication if you have a patient with a hip arthroplasty coming in with back pain. Take a look at the sacrum, right? The patient may have a sacral insufficiency fracture. And that's what a sacral insufficiency fracture looks like on CT. Tarlov cyst, these big cystic lesions in the spine, completely benign. They're just perineural cysts. And ivory vertebrae, I just wanted to show you because it's a nice picture, typically seen in metastatic disease uh, from prostate cancer or Paget's disease of bone. And it's really dense. See how this looks like a solid block of uh, ivory? It's called an ivory vertebrae. It's classic for prostate meds. When you see that in a male guy, oh, male guy, Male, um, he's got prostate cancer until proven otherwise. Okay, it's called an ivory vertebrae. I think that's the last slide for spine. Any questions? Totally boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anything about the spine, I want you to remember is remember the, the classification of discal disease. Bulge and herniations are two different things altogether. When we talk about it, it's two different entities altogether. And protrusions and extrusions are different, and they all refer to a type of disc herniation. Five-minute break, and then we do uh, repetitive stress injuries. <laughs>